come stai? Bene, tu? <ride> Bene. Eh. Sopravvivo tu pure? Sì, sì. Eh, sì, Ciao, sì. Ciao. Salve. Ciao oh, Giuseppe. Come stai? Bene, tu? <ride> Bene. Ah, stavo senza audio quando vi dicevo buon pomeriggio, scusate. Eh, sì. Ciao. Ripeto con l'audio, un po' come dice, ma lo tolgo per evitare rumori molesti al conferenziere. Ciao a tutti, ciao. Ciao Giuseppe, buon lavoro, ciao. Ciao a tutti, buon lavoro, ciao Alessio. Ciao, ciao, ciao. ciao. Ok. Let us start with the two speakers of this afternoon slot. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Alessio Porretta from the University of Roma to Bergada. The scientific profile of Alessio is well known uh, to all us. He obtained a PhD at Sabienza University and the, under the supervision of uh, Professor Lucio Boccardo, that is in our online audience. In the list of prestigious visiting positions, honors and prizes is very long. In particular, I would mention Carlo Miranda's prize for young research in mathematical analysis, obtained in 2002 at Academia Pontaniana of Naples. Gaetano Fitiera's prize for senior research in mathematical analysis given in 2018 by Unione Matematica Italiana, that is the um, Italian Mathematics Society. The, that's all. Then uh, it is my pleasure that Alessio accept uh, to give a talk here. Then uh, please, Alessio. Okay, so uh, Giuseppe, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful <laughs> presentation. And in particular for the big, big uh, job you are doing and you have done for the organization of this workshop uh, jointly with Enrique, of course, but uh, you are really working hard for that. So thank you and thank you for the introduction. Okay, so um, I will uh, talk about a couple of joint works with Philippe Souplet uh, from Paris. And the focus of my talk is uh, essentially the blow up analysis for uh, uh, viscous Hamilton Jacobi equation, if you want to call it that way, which is written here. So it's a very simple uh, equation is ut minus delta u equal the gradient of the solution taken to the power p. And uh, we do reclaim condition at the boundary and initial data. And uh, so here the domain is a smooth bounded domain, and the initial data is smooth if you want as compatibility condition. And the main point is the growth. So the growth of the nonlinearity is bigger than two, which uh, is sometimes called, uh, say, uh, beyond the, the, the natural growth condition. And uh, okay, this is a, a situation where new phenomena can be observed. And this is why I'm going to talk about that. And I already, I mean, there is a summary here that a mixed behavior somehow between second order and first order problems is observed due to this super quadratic growth. Okay, I must say that in the last, uh, say, 10 years, many uh, orders uh, have uh, studied some of, I mean, phenomena related to this super quadratic growth in viscous Hamilton Jacobi equation. So I will just briefly mention a few now well-known and well-established facts, which are different compared to the case of natural growth. So one is that bounded solutions are not necessarily smooth. This is a striking difference compared to the subquadratic or quadratic growth, which means that there is some threshold of held irregularity and there are gradient singularities. And probably we were with Italo Capuzzo Dolcetta and Fabiana Leoni, we addressed this fact for the first time. And then many other contributions were done to the regularity theory uh, during these years. Another feature that will appear in this blow up analysis is that distributional solutions are not really very suitable for this kind of equation. And I mean, first and foremost, because uniqueness may be lost in a weak formulation. 
And uh, uh, by contrast, the general theory uh, was addressed and developed in the framework of viscosity solutions, uh, which includes in particular a relaxed formulation of boundary conditions. Because there is a warning, which uh, of course was, was addressed in, uh, in, uh, in uh, earlier papers, that imposing directly boundary conditions may not be possible for this kind of equation. This is another effect of the first order behavior of the equation. So somehow you see that the, the L infinity bound uh, does not select itself uh, the good solution, the viscosity solutions are needed, the boundary conditions may be lost. All these kind of issues are typical of first order problems. And an explanation for that comes from, I mean, the control interpretation of this problem. And this is where possibly my talk, which will be a purely PDE talk, but this is where it uh, meets the purposes of this workshop, because the solution, uh, which as I will uh, recall is, is unique, is the value function of a stochastic control problem. So in particular, u of tx is obtained as the soup or the maximum, if you want, uh, of this uh, optimization problem. So here uh, you should imagine that you are trying to control the standard Brownian motion in, in Rn, and you are controlling the Brownian motion through the drift, which plays the role of a control. Then at time zero, you start from a point x in the domain omega, and then you you, you, you control, you try to control the drift uh, of this Brownian motion in a way to maximize this quantity. And, and you see that, and this will be the, the, the relevant case that I will address, which is U0 positive. You see that you will try to maximize the, the, the payoff given by U0 at time, at the position xt, uh, of course, uh, provided t is still smaller than the exit time from omega. And, and, and then you pay a price for using this control, which has a minus sign here. And okay, you have some normalized constant depending on p, and then you have some power of the control. And this of course is the expected value. So it's very important here to understand a kind of, of, of game that in this control problem you can do because uh, you can imagine that, for example, if u0 is positive and is large, you would like to reach the maximum point of u0 in order to maximize this nice term. But to do that, you should be careful not to go out of the domain, which means that you should try to fight against the Laplace and the Brownian motion in order to remain in the domain. But you pay a price for that. But why is p bigger than two so relevant? Because in fact, when p is bigger than two, uh, this cost functional, uh, you see when p is bigger than two, then p over p minus one, the conjugate exponent is, is smaller than two and possibly smaller and smaller. And this explains why in this case, a singular drifts are less expensive and it will be possible to fight against the Brownian motion to remain whenever possible, whenever it's convenient inside the domain and trying to get the payoff which maximizes your functional. So this is a first interpretation, then I can come back to that later. Okay, so the blow up problem, uh, and as I already announced, I will discuss the interesting case where the initial value is, is no negative, okay? And this implies that the solution is no negative. So let me start from what is well known, well established, but we will understand uh, the kind of phenomena we are going to, uh, uh, I mean, to, to underline. So first of all, if, if U0 is moved, say C1 and, and zero at a boundary, then classical parabolic theory says that in short time at least, you can construct a classical smooth solution. So there exists a maximal time, which can be finite or not, uh, for which there exists a standard C1 and even then more regular solution. And then there is maximum principle. So U remains bounded all time. So U of T is smaller than 
the initial uh, L infinity norm. Uh, but uh, so this means what? This means that if the C1 norm is going to blow up, this means that what is going to blow up is not the norm, the L infinity norm of U, but it is the L infinity norm of the gradient, which is called the gradient blow up. And there are many contributions concerning gradient blow up. So whenever the blow up is, is, is driven by the gradient of the solution, uh, there were previous contributions, of course, before our, our works. Uh, but, okay, so, sorry. Uh, so this is, uh, okay. So let me, let me still uh, remain on this gradient blow up. There are still well-known facts and those well-known facts were established in, in early papers by Philippe Souplet and, and Zhang eventually. Uh, so first of all, the gradient blow up certainly occurs for, for suitably large initial data. And it can only occur at a boundary. So I will give you a short proof of those two facts. So, well, first of all, the U is, is bounded for all times. This is by maximum principle. But also, if you remember that at least in a short time, the solution is smooth, and then you use the L infinity contraction, then you can bound essentially the, the time derivative of, of U in terms of the time derivative of the initial value at some moment T0 where the solution was, uh, was still smooth. So this means that the time derivative is bounded in my, in my model. And uh, so at any time T, U solves a stationary problem where the Laplacian is equal to a superlinear power of the gradient plus eventually a bounded term, which would be minus UT. And then you may apply, for example, the stationary gradient bounds by Lyons of the 85, which say that the gradient of U internally is controlled, is bound. Okay. So uh, in particular, you see the gradient is estimated uh, in terms of a negative power of the distance to the boundary and one. So this explains that the typical behavior you expect at the boundary is the behavior of a Hilder function, which whose gradient is going to blow up, but the function itself remains bounded. Then there is another kind of result in viscosity theory proved even earlier by Barl and Dalio in uh, 2004, that there exists a unique global in time relaxed viscosity solution, which means that uh, there is a viscosity solution which exists globally in time, admitting the boundary condition in a relaxed sense. This means that it is possible that U, which is always non-negative, it is possible that it might be strictly positive at a boundary. And in this case, the relaxed condition means that it is the equation that should hold, I mean, that the subsolution character should hold up to the boundary. This is like in first order problem when you cannot prescribe boundary condition, in which case it is the equation which brings the information up to the boundary. And uh, uh, okay, and this means, of course, the uniclassical solution, which exists in short time, of course, this uniclassical solution coincides with a unique viscosity solution. So this means that we already know that if there is blow up, then necessarily, necessarily the, the continuation after blow up is represented by this viscosity solution. So we already know that the, the, the problem can be prolonged after the blow up, uh, remaining, say, a relaxed viscosity solution. There are other regularity results which are not, however, relevant in my analysis. And let me also mention that this unique global viscosity solution, global in time, uh, if you don't like somehow viscosity solution, you may just look at that as the increasing limit of smooth solutions of truncated problems. So if you imagine that your super quadratic nonlinearity is truncated here, then you have a standard evolution problem which has a global in time solution. And then you take an increasing limit as the truncation parameter goes away and this converts to this unique solution. And it is clear from here that you might have some boundary layer actually in, in, um, at the boundary. Okay, so let me now mention that this loss of boundary condition certainly occurs. So this is not just somehow a threat 
that this, the, the solution may lose boundary condition. It, it, it certainly occurs for a large U0. Let me give you a, a short, I mean, argument for that. And this is the classical argument. So you multiply the, your problem by the first eigenfunction, and this is uh, absolutely justified even for the viscosity solution. You can justify this computation. And, uh, um, and then you, okay, you have uh, the term coming from the Laplacian here when you, of course, use the, 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 the first eigenfunction property. And then you would like, as it is standard argument in uh, blow up problems, to build an ODE which tells you that there will be blow up, okay? Okay, so you want to use the superlinear term. So now assume, assume that U remains zero on the boundary. Then you might use Poincare inequality here, dominating, uh, I mean, uh, the, the U by a certain power of the gradient, okay? So it's convenient, and of course, this dominates by, by Helder inequality, or if you want to buy Jensen's inequality, this dominated the, 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 the scalar product between U and the first eigenfunction. It's convenient here to use some power K, convenient so that you can also take here an inequality with a gradient U to the P multiplied by phi one, the first eigenfunction, then you get a negative power of phi one, but if you choose K conveniently, this is bounded which means that you can complete your, uh, say, typical ODE argument. And then you have that the integral of U against phi one, this is larger than the integral of U zero phi one plus, uh, I mean, the integral between zero and T of this function to the power P up to some constant. Well, it's not difficult to see that if you start with the integral of U zero phi one sufficiently large, then this guy will always remain positive. And then uh, you, I mean, end up with a typical uh, superlinear ODE, which tells you that the integral of U phi one would blow up. But is it possible that the integral of U phi one would blow up? Well, this is not possible because U is bounded by maximum principle. So where is the, uh, mistake somehow in this argument, where is the contradiction? The contradiction is that you cannot remain zero at a boundary to apply Poincaré inequality in this argument. So you must lose the boundary condition uh, provided the initial projection, you say the integral of u zero phi one is too large. And of course, if, if you uh, lose the boundary condition, the gradient must blow up. Okay, but there is more than that, and you will, uh, you will see how strange phenomena are in, in describe the behavior of this equation. So uh, some years ago, we studied with Enrique the long-time behavior of this equation for reasons motivated by controllability issues. This was our first joint work, and Enrique was interested in, in the controllability of uh, superlinear, uh, say, semilinear and superlinear uh, problems. And, and then because of that, we, we came to this equation and then we showed that for every initial data U0, the solution, the unique, if you want this closer to the solution, decays uh, exponentially in, in time and it goes to zero. And this was also a result which was proved earlier by Benashur, Dabuleanu Apcha and Lorenzo, but the proof that we gave with Enrique showed uh, one more interesting, very interesting feature that we proved that after some waiting time, uh, proportional more or less to the L infinity size of the initial data, then the function, the solution was certainly smooth up to the boundary. And in particular was a classical C1 solution. And then for that reason, it was decaying like the heat equation. So not only there is life after blow up described by the viscosity solution, but there is also a happy ending, I would say, because whatever U0 is, the solutions eventually become classical again and behave like the heat equation. So far, so far, so this is more or less where we started with Philippe Souple, our analysis, we knew that there was a gradient blow up we still uh, didn't know at which rate, uh, profile, and so on. Uh, that, that might be, and there was for sure, in some cases, loss of boundary conditions. But we also knew a completely 
uh, new phenomena, which was this recovery of boundary condition. So how this uh, new issue was described. So this is the spirit of what we described with, with, Philippe, with Philippe in a couple of words, starting by uh, trying to describe the blow up rate in the, of, of the gradient. Uh, so the first thing we, we, we did is to uh, try to give a rate of blow up and also a rate for the eventual smoothing of the solution. So here T star will denote the blow up time if ever, of course, and TR will denote the regularization time again, if ever, which means the ultimate time after which the solution remains classical forever in view of the results I had proved with, with Enrique, okay? And uh, what we show is that in both cases, uh, okay, so if, of course, there is blow up, then the, the gradient of U uh, is certainly blowing up at least with this velocity. So this is the minimal velocity of blow up, which goes like one over T star minus T to the one over P minus two. And similarly occurs at the regularization time. So the regularization time means that uh, the function will be smoothed uh, with this kind of uh, say rate, okay? So it, it, it was blowing up and then it will, uh, it will blow up more or less. In this case, T is larger than TR, okay? So I'm looking say backward. Okay, so uh, let, me, uh, let me just try to give a rough idea of this estimate because it's, it's uh, say it explains, even if this is more or less uh, a bit cheating, but technically cheating, but the idea is here. This is uh, the way, I mean, we reasoned with, with Philippe, is that if you try to build again an information on the gradient of UT infinity, uh, you may estimate that the derivative in time, so assume you are approaching the blow up time, so everything is smooth, U is smooth, so the derivative of this guy in absolute value is dominated by an estimate of the gradient of UT, of the time derivative of U infinity. But then UT solves a parabolic equation, which it just comes by taking the time derivative to the equation. And so by parabolic more or less regularity, if you want, the L infinity norm of the gradient of this solution of this UT is bounded by the function itself in L infinity norm, plus this drift term here. So gradient of U to the power P minus one. Okay, but we knew that the time derivative was bounded. I said this earlier. And so uh, this is bounded by a constant times one plus the function we are willing to study at the power P minus one. So if we uh, couple this information with this last line, we end up with an ODE, which says that at most, M prime of T is bounded by one plus M to the P minus one. And this gives an estimate uh, on m to the on m of t, uh, which is exactly the estimate I've shown you before. And, and this proof also shows that if you are careful, you notice that uh, the, the blow up rate might even be more singular. So actually it is possible that the gradient of u multiplied by the, the, this minimal uh, T star minus T to the one over P minus two. It is possible that this may go to infinity, meaning that the blow up is faster whenever the time derivative of U goes to zero at the blow up point, okay? So uh, the blow up point is when T goes to T star and X goes to, to the boundary of omega, because as I said, the, the gradient blow up can only occur at a boundary. And in fact, uh, if you look at this linear problem, if you know that UT is converging to, to zero near the blow up, say, point, then of course this constant, which is here, should be smaller and smaller. And so essentially you can just uh, uh, improve the above estimate into, into this one and, and show that this little O of one reflects into this, this property. Okay, so, so far, uh, this means that, uh, uh, okay, so I, I come back here to say that this blow up rate is, is 
then also known to be this minimal blow up rate is known to be optimal for some classes of solutions. For example, time increasing solutions or radial cases and so on. But as I already uh, uh, announced, faster blow up rates uh, can occur and I will, I will explain it later. Uh, I also maybe for, for specialists, I would also mention that this uh, rate of blow up is not actually the self-similar rate of, of the equation. When I say self-similar, I mean that the equation is invariant by this self-similar transformation, this dilation. And if you use this self-similarity property, then you would find that the gradient should scale like uh, one, say, lambda to the one over p minus one times the gradient. Of course, I mean, this, this self-similar behavior then we are in a bounded domain, so this is right sort of uh, ansatz in bounded domains. But actually, what we proved with Philippe is that uh, at least if we do have a, a single point blow up, so if the solution is blowing up in a single point of the boundary, then what we have shown is that the profile of the solution is completely uh, anisotropic, meaning that one over p minus one is, is actually the rate of the blow up of the normal spatial derivative, but uh, two over p minus two is the blow up for the tangential spatial derivative. And the, the, the time blow up is exactly in that case, one over p minus two as, as I mentioned uh, before. Okay, so let me now go back to a, maybe the most interesting fact to my viewpoint, which is this loss of boundary conditions. So uh, what we have shown here is that uh, loss of boundary condition may or may not occur. And this of course strongly depends on the initial data. So in particular, uh, we can build initial data for which the loss of boundary condition occurs everywhere on the boundary, for example. This was also observed by Quas and Rodriguez, more or less at the same time in the setting of viscosity solutions. And uh, even more precisely, if you give me an arbitrary relatively open set of the boundary, a relative open set of the boundary, then we can build an initial data U0 such that uh, there is loss of boundary condition uh, more or less on this relative open set because the loss of boundary condition only occurs in a subset of omega plus a small neighborhood, okay? So in other words, our first analysis was that one can prepare the initial data mu zero so that loss of boundary condition occurs at if any, say, relatively open set of the boundary. But uh, what are the relationships? between gradient blow up and loss of boundary condition. Because of course we wonder, is it uh, always true that uh, one implies the other? What are the typical situation? And uh, it, it is instructive here to uh, do it again. And this is quite typical in blow up analysis uh, that uh, you, you understand that there is a borderline figure, a borderline threshold situation. Uh, because it is, assume you fix an initial U0 and then you, you multiply this initial U0 by a parameter lambda. Then, as I told you, if the initial data is big enough, you have gradient blow up, you have the loss of boundary condition. And if, if the initial datum is very small, you have that there is no blow up and there is global in time solution. So you can define this sort of lambda bar, which is the, the minimum of the lambda for which there is blow up. And then what we show is that uh, the gradient blows up uh, at lambda larger or even equal than lambda bar, but the boundary value is lost only if lambda is strictly bigger than lambda bar. So this means that U lambda bar is exactly a typical figure where you do have gradient blow up without, without losing the boundary conditions. And uh, this distinguishes uh, in our analysis so what is a minimal blow up solution and a no minimal one. So a minimal blow up solution is a solution where if you start below, you are exist globally in time. And for this minimal blow up solution, what we expect is that you have a gradient blow up, 
but you don't lose the boundary condition, so you remain zero, and then you are regularized immediately. While for the non-minimal blow-offs, then we expect that you do have uh, both gradient blow-off and loss of boundary conditions. And this is what we uh, have exploited by fixing a reference class of initial data. So here, uh, uh, we just choose to, to reason on a class of initial data, which is, okay, I, I'm sorry, uh, I, I was uh, meaning to uh, produce a, a figure at hand, but then I, I, I mean, I could not, I mean, just before the, the, the talk. And, but this is a classical bump initial data. So you see this is initial data, which is symmetric in zero one. This is a one dimensional class of, of examples. And you may take some uh, initial data, which is symmetric at one half, and it is increasing then decreasing. So very uh, classical with uh, one more property, which, okay, it will be needed later. I will tell you why essentially to use the, 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 the lap number method by Matano. Okay, so, but you may just think and figure out in your mind the typical, very typical class of initial data, which goes, which is zero at the boundary. It's like a parabola, if you want, and uh, it, it's a, a typical bump. And then uh, what we show is that in this case, we can completely characterize the behavior at the evolution of the solution. So first of all, we, we see that U is a minimal blob solution if and only if, as I was mentioning before, it does not lose the boundary condition. In this case, we have an immediate regularization at, at, at the blow up time. And this is where the blow up rate is faster than the minimal one. And if you remember my previous slide when I explained the, the, the idea of this blow up rate estimate, this is because if you don't lose the boundary condition, this is because the time derivative essentially remains zero, it continues. You imagine that you are coming with zero boundary data, so the time derivative is zero at the boundary, and then it's possible that the time derivative does not jump, and then and that does not become positive. And this means that you, you have ut equals to zero, at the blow up point, and then you have a faster blow up rate. While uh, by contrast, uh, U is a non minimal blow up solution, if and only if it loses the boundary condition. And in this case, we can describe the blow up rate is exactly the minimal one, both at the blow up and at the regularization rate. And we also show that, 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 that U uh, leaves its boundary value zero, and you see it detaches linearly in time when you reach, when you reach the blow up rate, then U at X equals zero starts becoming positive, And then it also decreases in time and goes back to zero when at, at TR, TR is the regularization rate. So there is actually just one interval, T star TR, where the boundary condition is lost, U becomes positive, and then uh, after that, the U is, is uh, regularized again. So essentially, you can observe this picture. So this is a picture of the solution. So at time zero, you have a bump, you see? Then the solution starts becoming more and more steep at the boundary, and when it arrives at the blow up rate, the gradient becomes infinity, so the solution is held or continuous now, and then it leaves, it relaxes the boundary condition. So the solution leaves the imposed boundary condition and it behaves like, okay, here there is, there is a typo, so this is, a, it should be the primitive of this function. So U is, is still held or here, and the gradient blows up, and then after some time it goes back and recovers its boundary condition and then it's moved back, okay? And I, it is the first, I mean, to my knowledge, I do not know many second order problems when you can describe so precisely this uh, first order effect that the solution relaxes a boundary condition, uh, leaves for a while, say, uh, with another boundary con solution, which explains why the viscosity formulation was indeed needed and then it goes back and becomes classical again. And this happens only once in these two intervals because we started with just one bump, okay? 
and okay, so I, I won't say uh, too much of the method, but the method is, is uh, completely relying here for this very precise analysis on the zero number argument, uh, which was uh, elegantly developed by Angenon and Matano. And this zero number argument is, is played on the time derivative of, of the solution. Uh, okay, but let me mention that recently, uh, Philippe with, uh, with Mizoguchi, they also showed that uh, if you start with a more, say, complicated initial data, then you, of course, you may also provide different uh, bumps for the solution. So essentially, they have shown that if you, uh, I mean, start with uh, not such a simple initial data, where you may be more weird with more bumps, then you, the solution can... Uh, can uh, even again uh, lose once more the boundary condition, then take it once more and so on. So somehow this reproduces the effect of this U0. And before getting to, to the conclusion, uh, let me uh, comment that this is a, a very typical, uh, I mean, it's interesting to observe that this is an effect of the control problem behind. Because uh, what does it mean that the solution loses the boundary condition? Well, this means in the control problem, then even if you start close to the boundary or if possible, even at say the boundary or very near the boundary, this means that uh, you are able to uh, push the Brownian motion inside by using of course a singular drift, not a bounded one, a singular drift. So you are able to push the Brownian motion inside in order to be able to remain into the domain and then get your payoff and you see you zero how it is, you would like to get a positive reward for, for your process. And this is possible in this, for some say time horizons of your control process, but it is not convenient for others. So it's a, it's a very interesting explanation. Sorry, Alessio, oh, yes. in one, two minutes. Yes, yes, yes. But okay, my conclusion, I can even drop, I mean, and leave the conclusions if you wish, because I have already commented. Let me just mention that this kind of phenomena, say a uh, gradient blow up and the description of uh, what happens at the boundary seems very recently to have analogy with other quasi-linear equations, such as mean curvature flow with prescribed boundary condition. There is a very promising working process by Hiroshi Mitake and Zhang. And uh, we think that there are phenomena which are uh, similar, even if of course this is still uh, to, to be investigated. Okay, so thank you for the attention and uh, I, I stop here. Okay, thank you Alessio for the very nice uh, talk. Uh, there are uh, questions, comments uh, or remarks? Professor Lucio Boccardo, please. Uh, the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Alessio. Uh, thanks, of course. And perhaps uh, the question is too naive for you, but um, uh, in general, but uh, I do not like to discuss too general. Uh, I point out just one question about um, uh, the boundary condition, uh, yes. you look to the boundary condition. Um, do you imagine that the, this phenomenon still uh, occur uh, if uh, you change your problem uh, by adding uh, a zero order term on the, left, on the left side, of course, zero order term uh, like uh, u to the power sigma, sub for some sigma greater than one? Well, there may be some competition if sigma is large. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that this, this is possible. Yes, while if sigma, for example, uh, okay, I, I would say, but uh, this is just more or less a guess, but yeah. I would say that until sigma remains uh, sublinear or even linear, I don't expect any change. And for superlinear sigma, there might be some competition. There is also possible that still for some superlinear sigma, you may observe similar loss of boundary condition, but I would bet that if sigma is, is very large, uh, of course, this will depend on P, this phenomena may not occur because in that case, you have a stronger absorption uh, driven by the nonlinearity. So, I mean, I agree, this is possibly stopped 
if you, this phenomenon of the loss of boundary recognition may possibly be stopped if you had a very strong nonlinearity in you, yes. Grazie. There are uh, other questions or remarks? May I, may I ask something? Yes. Uh, so what about adding a coefficient in front of the Laplacian? Uh, I guess that the blow up will depend on the coefficient epsilon in front of the Laplacian. And as far as the system becomes elliptic, uh, you have some sort of compensation. Did you consider this problem? Well, of course, uh, of course, I mean, the, the, the analysis is, will be sensitive to the diffusion coefficient. But the kind of phenomena which means uh, that uh, you may lose the boundary condition is, uh, I mean, it happens whatever fixed coefficient you put in front of the Laplacian. Uh, you know that when epsilon goes to zero, then uh, you get the conal equation, uh, which uh, also, I mean, uh, have, uh, I mean, possibility to somehow lose boundary condition, even if, uh, I mean, if you judge the long time behavior, the long time behavior of the conal equation would be, would be completely different in any case, because the solution will probably translate in time towards a profile. And uh, so, I mean, the phenomena seems to be different. So, uh, I mean, at fixed epsilon, you will get similar kind of phenomena as I described. Possibly, of course, uh, you may, uh, they, they will depend on, on the coefficient, of course, so the, the, the strength mm -hmm. or, the, or also the, the dependence on the initial data, they will depend on the coefficient of the diffusion. If you do an analysis when epsilon goes to zero, well, this is, uh, I, I, I do not have a clear answer. It, it, it just may be interesting because the two equations behave very differently. I mean, with diffusion and without diffusion behave very differently in long time. So in that situation, you might have a combination. You are reducing the diffusion, but you are also observing this waiting time phenomena and uh, I'm not completely sure that uh, you may somehow commute uh, very freely yeah. those two parameter limit. And uh, so we should be uh, analyzed more carefully. Uh, and uh, so I don't have a clear answer. I, I think uh, an interplay is possible, but I, I don't have, I mean, any clear. Thanks. Okay. Another very, very short question, a very short comment, uh, remark. If no, we thank again um, Alessio for the nice conference and uh, we go to the next uh, uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Falcone. Okay. Okay, it is a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce also Professor Maurizio Falcone from Sapienza University of Rome. He is a great expert in numerical methods for PDEs, control theory and applications, differential inclusions. His activity has been hosted by many, many important uh, institutions and uh, he obtained many grants and honors. He has also a strong activity as organizer of many very interesting conferences in the school. An important, an important aspect of his career is that he was advisor of many researchers that became professor associate full in very, very soon. Thanks also in support with the generous advices for the them color. In this talk, uh, he um, uh, speak about a key structure algorithm for optimal control problems with the state constraints. Please, uh, Professor Falcone. So thanks, uh, Giuseppe, for uh, your kind introduction and invitation. I will also thank the other organizers, Enrique and Marco, for inviting me to this 
to this interesting workshop. I apologize for being late in arrival, but we were running a school in Chime at Cetraro uh, exactly in the same week, and uh, there was no way to, to attend to the meeting before. Okay, so uh, I, I slightly changed the title, putting an emphasis on state constraints, just because I want to uh, tell you something that we proved very recently. Uh, and I will start with a general introduction since the audience uh, is not focused on numerical methods. So I thought that it would be uh, reasonable uh, to give you an introduction to the to, to what we are doing and why we are doing this kind of research. And then I will uh, uh, treat in the second part some more technical issues. So this is a sort of summary of several papers we had. We wrote with Alessandro Alla, who is now in Pontificia Università Cattolica at Rio, and Luca Saluzzi, who is now in Bath. Okay, so. Okay, so this is the outline of, of, of my presentation. I will briefly call you advantage using limits of the dynamic programming approach from the numerical point of view. And then I will uh, enter uh, the topic of the talk that is a free structure algorithm uh, without state constraints. And I will conclude with the following with state constraints, giving you some theoretical results, namely a convergence result that is dealing with the convex case. Okay, so let me start with the introduction. So the interest of dynamic programming is related to the fact that you can obtain via dynamic programming a feedback control for general linear optimal control problems in a very general setting. All the classical problems, finite horizon, infinite horizon, state constraint, control of diffusion can be set in this framework. And for all those problems, uh, nowadays you can find the appropriate setting that, that brings you to deal with Hamilton Jacobi equations, first of second order, and derive feedback controls. Okay, so there are uh, several applications to uh, finance, to robotics, to uh, aeronautics, so, and also extensions to differential games. All this is, uh, in, is developed in the framework of viscosity solution for Hamilton Jacobi equations that you have seen uh, uh, mentioned by Alessio in the first in the first talk this afternoon. So nowadays there is a large amount of results covering more or less the, the classical uh, problems related to Hamilton Jacobi equation, although the, the field is still active. Okay, so the, the fact that we pass through the characterization of the value function and we want to solve a, a partial differential equation in I dimension can uh, result in a very intensive task from the computational point of view. This has been the bottleneck uh, for many applications. For example, you can develop a complete theory in our N, but you are in trouble when N is bigger than, say, 6 to 8 to, to uh, develop an algorithm that actually give you the approximation of the PDE in dimension 8 or 10 or even more than that. And so in many applied problems, the dimension is bigger than 10. And in particular, since here uh, there are a lot of experts dealing with the control of PDEs, if you start with the PDE, for example, with the heat equation or with the wave equation, and you uh, built up a semi-discretization in space, you end up with a system of ordinary differential equations that has hundreds or thousands of variables. So clearly, even if the theory uh, of viscosity solution is developed in our end, when you have to build your algorithm in dimension 100, you, you will not be 
uh, able to, to run your code in that dimension. So that's why it, it is very important to try to find a way uh, to reduce the cost of computations and to uh, avoid to work on a fixed grid. I, I will be back to this problem later. So we want to reduce the computational cost and we still want to have uh, an information regarding feedback controls and trajectories. So we, we really want to develop a dynamic programming approach, avoiding the contracting uh, system to solve the problem because that gives you just necessary conditions and will not give you a feedback control. Okay, so let me uh, introduce the model problem, which is a very classical one. Uh, is a um, if we have the deterministic infinite horizon problem, then we we are dealing with a system of ordinary differential equation in dimension d. F is in a linear system. I will be more precise later on the assumption, but essentially. The assumptions are the ones that guarantee the existence and uniqueness of the control trajectory, and you are given an initial condition. So you have a cost functional from zero to plus infinity, and you want to minimize the cost functional and to derive the value function that is the infimum of your cost functional over a set of admissible controls that are typically uh, set in a bounded domain in this framework. So here are the assumptions. Uh, so we have continuity with respect to the state and the control. We have boundedness. We have the Lipschitz continuity with respect to the state. So all these assumptions, uh, uh, plus the fact that we are dealing with the measure of the controls, tells you that there exists a unique solution trajectory to the dynamical system, since you can apply Karate-Odrisi. This is a very classical setting. So what we want to do is to compute the value function. Here you see the value function of the Zermelo navigation problem on the left. And even more important, you want to derive the feedback control at every point of the domain where you know the value function. OK, so I will uh, uh, present the, the method on the finite horizon problem. And so here, uh, there is a slight difference that you can also consider, for example, the dependence on, on time as an explicit dependence. But basically, the assumptions are very similar. We are always considering measurable controls with value in a compact set over n. And the functional we want to minimize is different because we are considering running cost with the discount factor e power minus lambda s minus t over the horizon from small t to capital T. And there is a final cost condition on, that is g that we apply at the final state, y capital T. And the final cost will be discounted as well. OK, so now the value function is the infimum over the set of admissible controls uh, or the cost functional, and is the, also the solution of a, an evolutive partial differential equation that you are going to see here. By the dynamic programming principle <clears throat> that uh, is given in this first rule, uh, you can derive the Hamilton Jacobi equation that characterizes the, uh, the value function. So you end up with a, a, an evolving problem that has a, a terminal condition at capital P, which corresponds to the terminal cost G. So it's a backward problem. And you have to solve this backward equation for all the initial conditions in a bounded set. Now, we are taking the x in Rd, but in practice, from the numerical point of view, we are always working on a bounded set. So this x will belong to an omega, and we are going to solve this evolutive equation on a bounded set. Okay, so we have a formal description of the feedback map, because once we know the value function, 
by the gradient of the value function, we can obtain uh, the feedback control at every point and every time t, just looking at the arc mean of that expression. So the, the, the dynamic programming approach is based on two steps. The first step, you solve the PDE, so the, the nonlinear Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. And once you have the solution of the PDE, you get back to synthesize the optimal feedback map. Of course, theoretical results guarantee in, a, in many general situations that there exists a unique solution to the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation in the viscosity sense. And uh, once you, you know that, you can obtain the feedback map. But from the numerical point of view, this can be very hard if D is bigger than, uh, say, 6. OK, so let me just uh, show quickly what is the dynamic programming approach in, in its discrete version. These are the so-called semi-Lagrangian schemes where you, you have a, a discrete time version of dynamic programming. So it's a backward problem. So once you start with V at time capital N, which replaces our capital T. So capital T will be capital N times delta T in this discretized version. So you have the final uh, value function at the final time, and then you go backward in time by a time step delta p, and knowing Vn, we will derive Vn minus one at the previous time, solving the relation that is written in the first row. Okay, so if you are working with classical methods for PDEs, you are working on a grid. So you have a discretized version of your omega, you have a grid, a regular with triangulation, and then Vn at the point xi plus delta Tf uh, should be computed by an interpolation operator, which is, a, uh, which is a very easy task if you are in dimension two or three, but it's much less easy if you are in dimension 10. Uh, you need a numerical domain uh, that has to, 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 um, has to be discretized by a, a triangulation. You need boundary conditions, and these are not always given in the problem because if the problem is, is set in the whole space, then you have to introduce additional boundary conditions that you, sometimes you don't know what to pull on the boundary, and everything becomes more difficult if the problem is in high dimension. So to solve these problems, there has been several, uh, several approaches uh, starting from the 80s. So either you split the domain into blocks by domain decomposition, and you try to make smaller problems that can be joined together in order to reconstruct the value function in omega. So basically, you have an hypercube in high dimension, and you divide this into small hypercubes and on every one of those, you have to impose boundary condition that make the hypercubes communicate. There is the iteration in policy space, an approach that is based on, on max plus algebra and Galerkin approximation, model order reduction, where you reduce the dynamical system to a lower dynamical system where you can approximate, say, a, system, a dynamical system in dimension 100 by something that has dimension three or four, sparse grids, spectral methods, and tensor calculus. There is a recent, is a recent direction or explicit or formulas when they are available. And of course, in the last few years, we also had some tentatives uh, dealing with neural networks. I mean, this is just to tell you that there has been a lot of activities in the last 10 years and uh, all these works try to compensate or to mitigate the curse of dimensionality. So what we are doing here is to eliminate completely the discretization in space. So we get rid of the, of the, uh, of the grid 
So if we don't want to deal with millions of nodes and we just deal with the time discretization in continuous space and we completely avoid any sort of interpolation. This is the idea that is behind the method that I am going to present. Okay, so the tree structure algorithm. First of all, let me introduce this simple idea uh, without constraints. So I am given an initial condition. So I uh, discretize my system with a delta T and I discretize my control set by a finite number of controls. So starting at X, after one step, I can reach N U discrete points, okay? And just to be simple, uh, if you apply the Euler scheme, the forward Euler scheme, this is the, the construction of the first step, I am leaving X and I have capital N U different directions, that connects me to X in a single step. Then I repeat this and I make a second step starting from all the points that I have obtained, this tau one uh, nodes. One on the top means that we are constructing the first level of the tree. If I apply the same rule to the points belonging to capital T1, then I obtain another set of points and I obtain N new discrete points for every starting point in the first level. So I obtain a tree. And the construction of the tree is based on my discrete dynamics that in this particular case is obtained by the forward order scheme, but can be replaced by any first, uh, and say a uh, one step scheme for ODEs, so Runde, Puta, Oin, or whatever. The, the, only, the only point is that the more you add, the more complicated the scheme is, the more complicated the description of the tree is. So that's why in the presentation, I will always use the forward order scheme. Okay, so you end up with a, with a huge tree where at every point you explore all the different directions that are given by the dynamics according to the discrete set of controls. And this becomes huge because this grows exponential. Okay, so in the computation of the value function, now I work on this tree. There is no, uh, uh, there is no grid underneath. So all the points that I'm considering, they belong to the tree and I'm not projecting on a fixed grid in space. So I can easily develop dynamic programming on the tree in the standard way, connecting all the points to the previous level and backward to the, to the original initial condition. So I don't need any kind of interpolation and the only problem that I have uh, is that the tree is growing exponentially, but I don't have a grid behind. Okay, so now uh, the dimensionality problem comes from the fact that the cardinality of the tree grows as capital N n bar plus one, depending on the number of controls you have at every step and depending on the number of time steps you have. Okay. So what I want to say is that we can prune the tree using, uh, using either an analytical uh, rule that cuts all the branches that are close all together because we exploit the Lipschitz continuity of the value function so points that are nearby are giving you more or less the same information plus an error, which is order one, as the scheme you are applying uh, in time. So we can prune the tree so that we can control the cardinality of the tree and we can drastically reduce 
the number of branches of that. So I don't want to enter in this technical detail, but what is interesting is that even if the cardinality of the tree is growing exponentially, in practice, you don't need all the branches. You just need a subset of those branches, and this subset can be much smaller than the original tree. Okay, now what about the state constraint problem? So basically, uh, we are dealing with the same approach, uh, but we are introducing a, a subset of constraints where we want to stay and we want to, to, to um, respect that constraint for all times. So we want our trajectory to be inside our, our omega bar uh, and a priori is not very clear that you can do this unless you have some compatibility condition. So this means that at every point X, you should know that your set of admissible control will allow you to stay inside the domain. So under uh, Sonner condition that is very well known, uh, that is a sort of compatibility condition saying that at the boundary, you always have a direction pointing inward with respect to the constraint. You know that the value function is continuous. If you don't, if you don't have that condition, you have this continuous value function, which makes the whole thing more technically complicated, but I mean, you, you will see some examples where the numerics will work, although the convergence result will not be will not be valid. So, provided you have the sonar condition and that yeah, that you can always stay inside the domain at least with one control for every point at the boundary, then the value function is continuous. And <clears throat> if you have Lipschitz continuity assumptions on the cost and on the on the dynamics, and if omega is bounded and is convex, uh, then, uh, then we can prove a convergence result uh, of the numerical approximation via the tree uh, to the constraint problem. Okay, what is the characterization in this, in this framework? Well, you have a, a, a rather strange boundary condition, which is not a Dirichlet or not a Neumann condition, which tells you that you must satisfy the hamilton jacobi equation inside omega in this viscosity sense, and you should have a super solution at the bound. That is why the second inequality, HXU grad U, greater or equal to zero is up to the boundary and the first one is only in the open set. So you must have a super solution at the boundary and the viscosity solution inside. Okay, so now this is the situation. With the sonar condition, you are always guaranteed that for every point, you still have a green direction pointing inward although there are also other directions pointing outward, but at least one is going to guarantee that you are going to satisfy the boundary condition. And in this framework, uh, it, it can be useful to apply liability theory, theory that has been developed by Jean-Pierre Ben and others uh, in, the, in the 90s. Uh, and this relates what you can do in the dynamical system with tangent points. So in the convex case, you have a rather easy description of the tangent point. Uh, in the non-convex case, you can use Clark or Bulligan tangent points, and the situation is uh, a little bit more technical from the point of view of the analysis. But in any case, the general idea is that uh, if you have sonar condition, then the trajectory can always stay inside omega, and the trajectory is viable if it satisfies yt belonging to omega bar for every t positive. Okay, so this is this is what I was mentioning. 
in the framework of multi-value maps if you introduce the tangent pole to a convex compact set capital K to be the closure of the union of one over H K minus X, then the necessary and sufficient condition for a viable trajectory that was proved by Adan is that the multi-valued map representing the dynamics has always an intersection with the tangent pole. Uh, so, we have a, a, a theoretical result that shows that if you are in the convex case for the constraint, the standard Euler discretization in time and the corresponding dynamic programming in discrete time will produce an approximation of the constraint problem that is convergent. I will go very quickly through that. So we have this Euler discretization in time. You have the analog discretization in time of the integral that, that uh, is made by the rectangle rule, basically. Beta will represent the discount factor, one minus lambda h, which is the first order Taylor approximation of the exponential. And the value function at the discrete time level will be represented by VH. So this is the value function of the discrete time problem. And of course, what is the, the, the new set of controls? This is the UHX, that is the set of discrete controls such that the discrete trajectory, depending uh, on that order scheme, will stay in omega for all discrete time n. Okay, so well, there are some preliminary results essentially showing that you are going to satisfy the adapt condition so that, that you have a, a direction that is always pointing inward with respect to the tangent pole. Then you prove that the discrete dynamic programming will work and give you a complete characterization also of the constraint case. And finally, you have a bound on the modulus of continuity of the discrete time value function and of the L infinity norm of VH in terms of the maximum of the running cost divided by the discount factor. And with all this, with all this, we, we end with the convergence theorem saying that if you have a state constraint in a convex subset omega one v, and if the discount factor is large enough, is bigger than the Lipschitz continuity constant uh, of the vector field, then VH will converge uniformly to the continuous viral function. This is a rather technical result that guarantees that our approximation is given in is going to give you a, an approximation of the value function. Okay, some numerical experiments. So now I will show you first a three structure algorithm uh, that is dealing with the dynamic of the harmonic oscillator in 2D in order to represent the the three easily, of course, in a nine dimension, it's almost impossible to show you a reasonable picture of what's going on because uh, it, it becomes too complicated. But anyway, in 2D, we can show you how it works. So we have an, a, a, a dynamics that is given by this dynamical system. The control is in minus one, one. The cost functional as a running part. The running cost L is nonlinear quadratic and is quadratic also the final cost. Okay, so this is the picture of the tree and the nodes of the tree. There is no hidden grid. The only points that you see are the points belonging to the tree is the blue part and the optimal trajectory and the optimal trajectory is in red. In the, uh, in the right, Picture, you see uh, the optimal trajectory for the unconstrained case where we give to the trajectory the possibility 
to go everywhere in the domain where we computed the value function. But on the left-hand side, we introduce a constraint. So we want that the, the state will not leave uh, on the right, will not go above the value two for the first component and above the value four for the second component. So as you see, in the constraint problem, the trajectory stops there, whereas the optimal trajectory for that constraint case goes up to, um, to, to satisfy the co final cost to be zero because at three, the final cost will, will match. Okay, so this is the comparison uh, between the cost functional in terms of the constraint and unconstrained case, where there is a perfect matching between what we know about the value function and the approximate value function. That's why you don't see two different colors, because they coincide. And uh, now there is a much more complicated example where the dynamics is very easy, but the state constraint is very complicated and is non-convex. So you have a linear dynamics that is just depending on you, and uh, the cost is given by characteristic functions, but which tells you that you don't want to, to go out of a given channel. Perhaps it is easier if I give you the picture. Okay, so here is the channel. So the blue part are the constraints. So I want to start from, from a point and I want to reach zero, zero, the origin starting up on the right hand side and avoiding all the constraints. As you see, the channel is non-convex and as a rather complicated structure. And here you see the comparison between the three structure algorithm that is the one where we only need the discretization in time compared in this case with the classical algorithm where we use a grid in space. So in this case, it, the dimension is two. So it's very easy to build a triangulation of that domain and we can apply the classical algorithm using the interpolation. But as you see, the three structure algorithm compared with the one that is based on the grid in space is not far. I mean, they are almost coincide. So the, the value function is represented here. And you see that uh, say is, is decreasing to the target point, which is at the origin and the blue part of the second picture on the right represents the description of the tree structure. That, as you can expect, is following the dynamics. So it's filling the channel by the tree. And what is interesting to remark is that the tree easily incorporates all the information regarding the constraint because the constraint can be used in, also, in order to prune the branches of the tree that are supposed to go outside the constraint. So there are two pruning of the tree. The first one is related to the fact that branches that are very close, um, very close uh, are cut just because one branch is enough to have the, more or less the same information and branches that are going outside the constraint are cutted because they do not respect the state constraint problem. Okay, so the conclusion is the, is the following. So we have now an algorithm that is based only on time discretization. We don't have a space discretization and we don't need for interpolation during the numerical method. Pruning the tree can mitigate the curse of dimension and can also take into account state constraint. 
we can extend this approach to get high order methods simply using Runge Gutta or uh, second order methods to describe the, the, the dynamics. We don't have a uh, restrictive assumption on non-linearities because the, the dynamics can be just Lipschitz continuous and the controls are just measurable uh, with values in a compact subset. This method has been also uh, coupled with the model order reduction techniques. And in uh, some of the papers, uh, we have applied this to the control of PDEs, namely to the wave equation and to the heat equation, where of course, without, uh, without pod, you will end up with uh, thousands of, of nodes. And these are some directions that we are going to uh, develop in the next future. One is the application to stochastic control problems, more uh, accurate reconstruction of feedback controls and other techniques to, to uh, apply the pruning to cut the branches in a, in a, in a way that can, be, can produce a error estimate. This is the most important. Okay, so here are some, some references where you can also find applications to partial control of partial differential equations. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation, Professor Falcone. Uh, are questions, comments, remarks? Can I ask something, Giuseppe? Please, please, of course. So, sorry, Maurizio, I, I lost uh, the first part of your lecture. So, it was, I was trying to, okay. you know, to, to, to extrapolate, to how it but um, <laughs> to so, uh, there are, I mean, the, the kind of uh, ideas you mentioned and uh, and the drawings and so on reminds a lot to, uh, well, some of the presentations I have seen without understanding often the, the complete details about so more engineering, you know, control, reinforcement learning and so on when, when people try to simultaneously use the dynamic programming principle to discover the dynamics and simultaneously discover the best path or the best optimal control, combining both, uh, say, deterministic and stochastic uh, uh, arguments, right? So a smart combination like uh, Q-learning and so on. Is somehow your talk related to this? No, uh, the, the three structural algorithm doesn't make any use of uh, reinforcement learning or uh, machine learning. So we are very simply uh, trying to give an approximation of a known dynamics. Of course, if the dynamics is not known and the, and the F uh, that is driving the system is unknown or partially unknown, then you, you should move in the direction of reinforcement learning. But this is not the case in, in okay. this presentation. So, this is, so, so here, here the, the paper, dynamics here is known. Paper, no, let, let, let me ju just give you an information. So we have a couple of papers on uh, unknown dynamical systems that are uh, known to be linear, but where the matrix capital A is unknown. And in that case, we have developed a reinforcement learning kind of approach. But in this presentation, the dynamics is completely known. So we are just applying a, a one step method for the dynamical system that in the presentation was earlier, but it could be Runge Kuta or whatever, any other one step method will, will do the job. Okay, thank you. So maybe you can send me the slides, Maurizio. I will then have a look okay. to the first half. And I can also send you the, the papers on the reinforcement layer. That yeah, is a please. different problem. Yeah, please. Or if you have a slide, okay. the slides okay. are easier to read. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you, Maurizio. Okay. There is, a, there is another question of by Sandra Garillo. Uh, please, Sandra. I, I see that there is a question by Sandra Garillo. Sandra? 
Uh, sorry was a mistake. I, I uh, pushed the sorry. It was a very nice talk, but I had no question. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, so no, no problem. Okay. okay. Other questions, <laughs> remarks? Okay, if, if no, we thank again Professor Falcone. And uh, we will start. Thank you. We will start uh, at uh, 4 uh, 45 p.m. Uh, the next chairman uh, will be Professor Falcone, and the next two uh, speakers will be uh, Lorena Boschu and Pierluigi Corri. See you later. Stavo cercando di riuscire a fare delle cose.